Welcome to the Halloween episode of our podcast. Hope you enjoy. (laughs) Welcome to Why Complain When You Can Whine, making sense of the senseless, three professional women attempting to make sense of the toxic nonsense while drinking wine. (laughs) I am Dr. Jody Lorman, Psych Dr. J, Dr. J, Jody, any and all of the above. I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of California. And this is solely for entertainment purposes only. Obviously, after you hear it, you'll know that. (laughs) Um, With a little bit of psychoeducation, (laughs) there is no therapeutic relationship intended or implied or given. Um, This is our Halloween episode. And in honor of our Halloween episode, I am wearing my Halloween candy cane Disney (laughs) ears. And my orange and black. And I am drinking Apothic Red Winemaker Blend. I didn't have my dearly beloved because I like the sugar skull on it, but I thought this was very Halloween-ish also because it's, you know, kind of cool. And I have two glasses. I have the (laughs) Drink Up Witches. I'm not going to drink both of them. (laughs) (laughs) And I have Witches Gotta Stick Together. Ooh, I love that one. I'm going to use the witches got to stick together. Hell yes. This is mine. And now on to you, Heather. I'm Heather. I'm a licensed professional counselor in Colorado. I'm also a domestic violence survivor. I am drinking apothic also, but I'm drinking the dark. Ooh. Yeah. It's very Halloween-y too. And then my wine glass is this masterpiece love i love it and it says um something wicked this way comes very nice hello i'm ashley page i am the founder of loving single i am a dv and sa survivor single mom and tonight i have equally a scary martha shard <laughs> 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 no, this is very fitting for Halloween. Um, and then I'm so excited because I am quite obsessed with this wine glass. Oh, oh, oh it's a little, oh. it's a little lady Frankenstein. I know. This is Frankenstein. She's like she's gonna be drinking with me tonight. Love it. And okay. I'm pouring heavy tonight. I'm pouring heavy tonight, ladies, because it's been that kind of week. It I got oh my god. I haven't really eaten today. Just letting y'all know. <laughs> we're in for surprise. Heavy pour. Heavy, heavy pour. Heavy pour. Heavy pour. We're having a good time. It's Friday. <laughs> Period. So what's on deck? How we start. We're making sense of nonsense. Last week, or la- yeah, last week or the week before, we talked about the first two of the cluster Bs, ASPD and BPD. Tonight is HPD, histrionic personality disorder, and NPD. Drum roll. Yes. <laughs> part two, part two of cluster B. And Let's let me tell go. you, Narcissistic personality disorder is going to be the vast majority of what we talk about. When it comes to HPD, histrionic personality disorder, people don't really know a lot about it. You don't really hear a lot about it. Um, HPD, um, in my, this is just my opinion. This is not a scientific thing. But in my opinion, HPD, histrionic, is one of those personality disorders, whereas narcissist and borderline and ASPD are kind of, they want to, in some ways, they have disregard for people, no empathy and all of that. HPD is one of the ones where you're just like, fucking obnoxious, Mm -hmm. (laughs) annoying. Um, They want to be the center of attention. 
me, me, me. It's always about me, whether it is good or bad. They want to be the center of attention. And let me read a little bit about it briefly. A pervasive pattern of excessive emotionality and attention seeking beginning in early adulthood. Um, they are uncomfortable in situations where they are not the center of attention. They will often um, be inappropriately sexually provocative or just plain old provocative. Anything to get attention displays rapid shifting and shallow expression of emotions, consistently uses physical appearance to draw attention, has a style of speech that's excessively impressionistic and lacking in detail, shows self-dramatization, theatrical theatricality and exaggerated ex expressions of emotions is suggestible, easily influenced by others. And they consider relationships to be more intimate than they actually are. Those are the people that I guess the, the one of the easiest ways for me to describe it, Amber Heard was diagnosed <laughs> with NPD and HPD. I'm sorry, BPD. EPD and HPD. And I think it was the BPD that really got her into the most of her problems, not the HPD. But those would be the people, if we want to, if we, this is not one person in particular, but a social media influencer or someone on TikTok who is what people call a clout chaser. They're just out there chasing clout, grabbing onto anybody's coattails. If they're not being, if their views drop, they'll post something very like <gasps> shock producing or just like something to get views, to draw the attention back to them. If somebody else is going through drama on social media and they've never even interacted with this person before, all of a sudden they'll do videos analyzing it making it about them and how this relates to them. And it kind of changes to be about them. And Ashley, I think I showed you, I think Heather, I sent it to you too, a video where an example of somebody doing that, taking an incident that happened um, a couple of years ago on TikTok to a creator. And instead of discussing what happened to that creator, they discussed the creator, but then how it applied to this is what's going on with me now. And it's like, no one cares. <laughs> no one really cares. It's not really relevant. You're just doing it to get the attention by using this creator to get people drawn to you to make it about you. So that would be, I'm not saying that is exactly histrionic, that person, but that would be a trait of histrionic personality disorder. Heather. It's a good example. I'm also kind of fascinated by, I don't see histrionic a lot in my, in my work, um, but I'm always sort of fascinated by like the melodramatic expression of emo emotion <laughs> versus the shallow like experience of emotion that they have. Um, Melodramatic's a good word. Yeah. That's a good word. Yeah. And, and, and so you, you got to think like you, Yes, you could take like a TikTok creator example, a clout chaser example and say, okay, that looks like histrionic. And then you have to multiply it a little bit, right? And then you have to expand it out to this is how they are in every aspect of their life, not just on social media, not just on Instagram or TikTok. So they're at work making big dramatic scenes about everything being really, 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 really uncomfortable if they're not the center all the time of attention all the time and in a delusional like there's a very like there's a delusional kind of thing that goes across all of cluster b they're not really living in reality most of the time so their own so, reality yeah their, their reality their is reality, very reality, different yeah. from what reality actually is so their main delusion in histrionic is it like for narcissistic it's like this self-importance and in histrionic it's their relationship with others as being more intimate than they actually are it's like like they really believe they have connections and closeness with people some that some are like people they've never even met so that it's you've got to take these characteristics and multiply them and make them extreme so that, you know, I don't want people thinking that they have some of these traits and wondering if they have 
a personality disorder. So remember, we all can have traits and tendencies. They ebb, they flow. That does not mean that it's a diagnosable personality disorder. Also, if it has to typically affect your social, emotional, occupational functioning in a personality disorder, you don't think it does. Everybody around you think it thinks that it does. So you may be getting in fights with people and arguments with people left and right, and they're the ones that are wrong. They're the ones that are crazy. It is never you. So the person with the personality disorder does not believe they have any problems functioning socially, emotionally, or occupationally, or otherwise. But if you ask everybody around them, they would be like, absolutely 100%. Like somebody that, let's just say histrionic, I'm not saying this is an absolute, this is an example, might have gone from job to job to job to job because they just, you know, it, they weren't getting the attention. It was going to somebody else. They didn't like it. Um, they would cause problems. So they would say, no, I don't have any problems it's my fucking job. It's my bosses. So with the personality disorder, as with a lot of um, the DSM, a lot of mental health issues, it has to cause problems with your social, emotional, and or occupational functioning or distress to you. And if it causes distress to you, it's causing problems in your social, emotional, occupational functioning somewhere. So with um, histrionic, there, and this is why it doesn't, I don't think you see it. We necessarily see it as much because it's more of a, oh my God, I don't want to be around this person. <laughs> just drain your energy, not in a mind fucking gaslighting kind of way, but in a, holy crap. So in like, in other words, what I'm hearing is because the, the truth is, is for people who don't have, who aren't psychologists and therapists, it all sounds very similar. It all like when we talk about all these personality disorders, I'm like, I'm on, I'm like, honestly sitting here. I'm like, yeah, that sounds exactly like what we were talking about with BPD. That sounds like what we were talking about. Like ASPD is very, it's, you know, it's a little bit more as far as like their criminal history and their violence and things like that. But BPD, narcissism and histrionic, they're all very similar. So what I'm hearing is, when we're talking about histrionic, if we were to define a personality styling to the extreme, it would be the drama queen. Yes. So I just want to make sure that we're breaking it down in a very simplistic way. So people who have no clue and they're thinking like they're listening to these episodes and they're like, oh my God, they all sound the same. Like, how do I tell the difference? Histrionic is like the drama queen. So Whereas like narcissism, and we'll get into that, is very self-important as far as they don't really give a fuck who they step on and who they hurt and who they take advantage of. And they don't really care about the status of their relationships as far as they're, they're furthering themselves. Histrionic is more of not so much self-importance, but relational importance as far as placing themselves as everyone needs me and my value in these relationships is irreplaceable and <laughs> like very much like the self-importance inside of relationships rather than outside of within narcissism. Is that kind <laughs> of a good? I think with ASPD, yeah. you think of criminal and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm just saying if you want to kind of match ASPD criminal, BPD attachment issues and abandonment issues. Push you away, pull you back. Push you away, pull you back. Push you away, pull you back. Histrionic is, look at me. Why aren't you looking at me? Why is this not about me? Drama queen and you just kind of go, I can't handle this person. And it's also like a bunch of like one upping, isn't it? With histrionic, like no matter what I have to say, you have a bigger story, you have a bigger trauma, you have a better relationship, you have a, a better connection, you have a better experience, you have a worse experience. Like no matter what I have to say, 
you're going to outdo me. A hundred percent. I have a friend and I'm not saying she's histrionic by any means, but this would be an example. No matter what, everything is better or everything is worse. She is one of those people. However, one time my son was molested and I told her and she literally said, I, I don't know what, I don't know what to say about that. Shallow. And I was like, yeah, I you don't because you can't <laughs> one up that and you can't one worse that. So you're stuck in, oh, wow. That is that you win the contest, you know, and it's not a contest. But that's what a histrionic person that's like, you know, there's one person in this world that has it. If they say, you know, somebody has it worse, there's always someone that has it worse than you. There's seven over 7 billion people in this world. So that means that there's one person that's really fucked because there's got to be that person that's the worst. That would be the histrionic. Well, that's me. No one has it worse. Than me. But, you know, I just, I got an inheritance. And so I'm buying a yacht. It's 50 foot. Well, you know, no one has it worse than me, but I have a 51 foot yacht. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, 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 what? How do you, I, I, again, same friend was talking about how they have to, had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to the IRS because they make so much money and then turned around and talked about how they needed free lunches for, for mm -hmm. school. It's like, but why? If you make that much money, why do you need free lunches? Uh, well, because we, we, well, we don't make that much money. Okay, do you or don't you? It all depends on what the, the, you know, if the discussion is how much everybody makes, then they gotta make more. If it's how much everybody doesn't make, then they gotta make less. So yes, it is the one-upping or the one-downing. Whatever's mm -hmm. gonna get them the, <gasps> I broke my arm. I broke it in five places and my shoulder. And my yeah. Tip. So whereas narcissists need the attention and admiration, people with histrionic personality disorder, they don't really care what kind of attention it is. It doesn't have to be admiration as long as it's attention, as long as it's about them. And then you have to add, you know, the, the, the drama queen, they're, they're really melodramatic about everything. So, uh, it, it, you know, like with this person that Jody's talking about, like when she's talking about these things, I imagine her having like these big, like expressive kind of dramatic storylines underneath it, right? As she's telling it. So you, the way to really know Cluster B is to just have a relationship with one of them right? Like if you're a friendship or relationship, like, and then suddenly, you know, holy fuck, there's something way off about this. This person is not okay. And so I think that's why it's easier for clinicians sometimes, because we have to encounter these people on such more of a regular basis that they're in, in they're accessing mental health. And so after enough interactions with the different types of personalities you just sort of like feel something internally happening with you and you're like I know what this is so and I think I think it's really difficult to remain in a relationship with a borderline to remain in a relationship oh with a narcissist right. I think that you can remain in a relationship with histrionic but it is that reaction that you just had Ashley of, oh my god it's like, that's what you do every time they open their mouth. You're like, yeah. well, people that and don't the, know them will be enthralled by their stories. Right. Well, and well, so, so what I was going to say was I can, I can look at my life and I can, when we talk about ASPD and then BPD and then narcissism, I can give, oh, I, I'm familiar with someone who's very, very, ASPD. I'm familiar with someone or my ex has BPD. I'm familiar with someone who's very much a narcissist. But then when I look at histrionic, I'm like, is that one? I don't want to say the word more rare, but I mean, because so many people are very dramatic and like, I know so many drama queens. I know so many drama kings 
but not to such a significant over exaggerated degree to which we're like, we're discussing right now, because I know so many people who are like, I got to one up you, or I've got to do, you know, um, I've got to be the center of attention. I feel like social media makes histrionic very convoluted and very muddy because of how much it brings out in everyone's like histrionic tendencies. Um, it's pretty rarely diagnosed too. I think it is pretty rare. It's, I don't I, come I'm across it, it very right often. now. But I think, let's see, 2.1% of the per general population. So yeah, when you have up to 6% of NPD and up to 6% or 6% VPD, and then God, I don't even, I didn't even look up HPD, or I'm sorry, ASPD, but 2.1%. And I think honestly, part of the reason you don't run into it is because those are those people like, you know, I'm just thinking about my little, my little <laughs> ears. It's like, let's say they were going to, a formal dress party but they don't they want to look different so they would do something like this as perfectly normal you know they their dress has got to be more provocative if they're going they'll they're not necessarily sexually provocative but they'll have and having a lot of tattoos does not make you hpd but they might have a lot of tattoos they might have a lot of piercing things to make them in their minds stand out from other people so they're not going to be i don't think I honestly, my, again, this is my opinion. I don't think they're as toxic. I think they're more annoying, <laughs> but I don't think they're as toxic. Yeah, because I feel like there's such a fine line between histrionic and self-discovery, right? Like, I mean, I could be wrong, but like how many times like people are like, I don't want to fit in. I want to stand out or like, I'm, you know, discovering myself or, um, you know, I want to be different and histrionic is way, 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 way extreme. Yeah. And I, I mean, just like, like I said earlier, it just seems like it's so much more rare because, and perhaps it's just because we're so inundated with self involvement with, because of social media that it makes it more difficult for us to identify because so many people are so vain and so like there's a difference between self-love and self-obsession and vanity and so I may I feel like it makes it harder for us to identify of the histrionic because just the the obsession with self is so prevalent these days that to be able to identify it at, to such an extreme is difficult because I I mean I'm like well hell either everyone's histrionic or I don't know anyone who is yeah and I think I'm sorry go ahead oh you're good I was just thinking that that I always I always I want to add the element of there's an element of delusional stuff happening with histrionic that doesn't happen with like the normal everyday clout chasing you know self-seeker in the world like there's an element in their dramatization of everything that is not reality based. And that's what makes it easier, I think, to differentiate from the rest of the population that just has a collection of these traits that are fairly normal now <laughs> because of social media and other reasons. But I, I think there's just a, an extreme element of lack of reality that, that these people tend to have and just the disconnect from actual relationships with people where other people with these kinds of traits can still interact and have relationships with people even if they're kind of obnoxious sometimes or they're you know whatever but you can still um they can still function in the world these people have a really hard time functioning in the world and in relationships because they're so so beyond what reality is that um, that it, it, it just doesn't work for them. So I think I think with social media and the and YouTube and the advent of like I think of and I'm not saying I don't know him. He is not my client. I am not diagnosing him by any means. But I think of somebody. What pops into my head is like a Logan Paul. Like if you know anything guy? about Logan Paul, he's a 
big um, YouTuber. I think he started on YouTuber. Now he does boxing or MMA. He moved to that because he could. And his brother, Logan Paul and... People are going to listen to this and be yelling at the screen, at the, the, the <laughs> podcast that they know who these people are. Not but us. We're like, like, okay. <laughs> you know, he just, because Logan Paul uh, moved to Puerto Rico or something to take advantage of the tax laws, but then he had to weigh in on Bad Bunny and Bad Bunny's things. And it's like, Logan Paul, you're not, you're not relevant and in the same league of Bad Bunny. So Logan Paul, oh, Jake Paul, I think is the other one the brother but it's like they have to be relevant they have to be seen they have to be over the top um one of the pauls i want to say it's jake paul i don't follow them i just happen to see them one of them bought a baseball card like the most expensive baseball card diamond encrusted went to dubai did a video on it look at me look at how great i am not saying he's histrionic but what i'm saying is social media has kind of made it hard to distinguish between and made it easy for histrionic people to actually have a platform of look at me, look at me, look at me and car yeah. chasing and melodrama and stuff like that. So I think it's yeah. been easy to, an easy place for them to, to succeed. Well, and I think too, you know, as, because I've owned several businesses and <clears throat> I have, you know, one of the most important things in owning a business is marketing. So marketing is very much like if we were to describe his like marketing as a personality disorder, marketers in their own right are very, they, they must, it requires histrionic traits because you must be, look at me, look at me, look at me. Yeah. Like you have to create noise. You must be louder, better, more different. Imagine than that everyone. in a person. Imagine yeah, and, and that in a person. That's what I think of is like when I hear like everything I know about marketing in order to market a business, in order to be seen and heard in the sea of noise with all the other businesses, you must be overtly exaggerated or overtly stand out or overtly either provocative or controversial or mm -hmm. any of those things. And so I'm like, God, is that what makes marketers so great is those histrionic tendencies. Um, but that's what I think of. And so understanding the difference between, you know, there's a certain level of like balance and also it's so hard because I feel like histrionic is the most rare of all the personality disorders in cluster B that it's difficult for us to find a very credible source for us to look at because either Hollywood social media or marketing makes it very hard for us to differentiate what exactly is histrionic because we're so conditioned to that type of behavior that it makes it almost normalized for us. If you can believe it, NPD was not supposed to be in the latest edition of the DSM. When the DSM-5 came out, they were going to get rid of NPD. Yep. NPD is far more common by 4%, which might not seem like a lot, but far more common by 4% than HPD. NPD is fucking dangerous. And HPD really isn't. I think with the advent of social media, HPD has a home. Do you remember what their argument was to get narcissistic personality disorder taken out of the DSM? Yeah. It's written mainly by old white male psychiatrists <laughs> who did not believe that NPD was really an issue. And they don't practice. These are also non-practicing clinicians. So thankfully, they listened to practicing clinicians who said, what the fuck do you think you're doing? And they kept it in. But yes, because it's old white men, psychiatrists, didn't believe. And I wonder how many of them are NPD. So, so let's not make it an issue. Take it out. Right. Um, yeah. 
So oh, wait, hold on really quick. Can we, can we divert there for one second? And we won't stay there for very long. So what you're telling me is that DSM is written by Caucasian men. For Mostly. the most part. For the most part. They, so, they try to diversify and add psychologists, add women. But if you go through the back of the DSM and it is public, anybody can buy it. Anybody can find it online because I've done this. Look to see one, how many times I see PhD versus MD and how many women I see and how many names. And I know you can't just go by the names, but how many names sound like they are not white. Mm -hmm. um, there's some. Yeah, the DSM is not the fucking bible i know some people you know want to be like in the dsm it says x y and z you what i would like everyone and jody knows this but i would like everyone to know <laughs> is that this book has evolved and is always evolving because mental health and psych disorders are always changing and evolving in terms of what is considered normal versus abnormal research studies that are you know done on more varieties of people and, you know, and, and, and getting more data things. I mean, homosexuality was a person, uh, not a personality disorder, but was it its own disorder mm -hmm. years and years ago. So it's changed and evolved with the times because that's what people do. So I think in the future, personality disorders on in cluster B, especially aren't going to look the same either I think because I don't look at them as boxes hardly anymore I sort of see everything because I work in criminal justice and I see a lot of people with cluster b traits who are really problematic they're more on like a spectrum to me so I know they've been talking about putting the personality disorders more on like a spectrum like you have like this amount of this trait or whatever and or these traits and therefore you know your x amount of a problem to your life <laughs> but i see i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna agree slightly disagree in the sense of it is the bible of mental health diagnosing That's however it, it is <laughs> open to interpretation and it shouldn't be taken verbatim like you can say this is the criteria, but it does not tell you how that criteria manifests, what that criteria looks like. So if you just look and go, well, the criteria says it must be this. It's like, but this can look like that. This can look like this. This can look like that. So <laughs> it's, you have to not take it. You have to take it at face value. Mm -hmm. And that's why I tell people, you, you, if you are not a mental health professional, Feel free to look at the DSM. However, <laughs> don't go self-diagnosing. <laughs> exactly. We dissect that thing. We take it apart. By the time I did it once in my master's program, and I think three times in my doctoral program, you take that shit apart, upside down and inside out, and you look at it and you say, okay, well, it says this, but this, if you are a lay person that doesn't know, looks like this. And it looks like this and it looks like that. But you may not know that by looking at the word. So yes, it's the Bible for diagnosing, but it's not just like the Bible in general. Everybody interprets it. How many different interpretations of the Bible are there? So right. there's different, yeah. You, so you read this and you say, okay, this behavior falls under this. Now, a lay person may not know that, but a trained mental health professional does. Or in women, this is how this behavior looks. In men, this is how this behavior looks. A trained professional hopefully will know that distinction. There are sadly a lot of professionals that don't differentiate between how something manifests in women, hence the term hysteria back in the 19, what, 20s. Um, so it is, and, and I, what I don't like about the spectrum aspect of it is 
NPD, we can have traits and tendencies that ebb and flow. But once someone's, when someone's diagnosed NPD, they're, they're, I mean, I know people with traits and tendencies and I know people with. And the people yes. with traits and tendencies are a lot different than the people with. And, and as far as the spectrum goes for MPD, they're all fucking dangerous. They're well, all I think dangerous. that. I think that that's an excellent like segue into NPD because I think the reality is is HPD uh, HPD is so rare and you know I think that I, the one thing that people want to know the most about right now is NPD and I think that it's every single person that I know knows someone that they think either has one been diagnosed with NPD or two has NPD. So let's talk about NPD because we could talk about this for the rest of our lives. Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you what NPD is not? NPD is not someone who is egocentric, full of themselves, an asshole who thinks they're better than everybody else and is in love with themselves, if you will. That's narcissism. That's a narcissist. That is not NPD. They are not the same. So you can have someone who is like, damn, you love yourself way too much, don't you? They can be a narcissist as whatever, narcissa or whatever, if you go back to the fable. No, not a fable, whatever it's called. Um, I know people are listening to this podcast going, oh my God, she doesn't know anything. It's wine, people. <laughs> um, we're not working but- right now. We're just yapping and drinking. <laughs> I don't have to be right all the time. <laughs> but NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, those people, a narcissist is just annoying. Or not, an asshole is an asshole. But an NPD, a diagnosed or diagnosable, because they only go to therapy to prove that everybody else is crazy and not them. Oh. So they don't go to therapy. So a That's diagnosable right NPD, they're dangerous. They're dangerous and they're really quite exhausting. Okay, so let's break that down. Let's break that down for one second because I want to stop there because I know that there are some listeners that are like, what the fuck? You just said they're a narcissist. Someone, a narcissist is different than an NPD. Now, for, for myself, when I'm creating content, I talk about narcissistic people versus NPD. A, nar- yeah. a truly diagnosed DX narcissist. So when I'm like, damn, you're very narcissistic, you know, like I myself have even, am even careful calling someone being like, he's a narcissist. She's a narcissist of being like, you're very narcissistic. Full of themselves, egocentric, that kind of narcissist. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I'm really right. glad you make that distinction because it's really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it is it is truly, truly different because I can be very extremely narcissistic when you put me in specific settings. And, and when you catch me on the right day talking about mm-hmm. the right thing or when, for example, I'm a very different human creature when I'm mooning versus when I'm just myself, like when I'm not hormonal. So that, I mean, there, there will be different traits that are brought out of me. So I want to make sure that we're making that distinction. Not everyone, you know, I tell this to people all the time, not everyone is a narcissist. Sometimes we can all be very narcissistic, but a narcissist is a narcissist is a narcissist 100% of the time, 365, 24, seven. And it's not an ebb and flow. This is Mm -hmm. who they are in their DNA. And I don't want to be like obnoxious about it, but. No, and that's true for all the cluster B. It's who they are in their DNA, right? It's not just a trait. So the thing with NPD is they can be very successful. Yeah, it's a, they can be be good traits to have to get by in the world. Yeah, they can be presidents. They can be CEOs. And have been and are. Mm -hmm. Because they have no qualms 
about fucking over and stepping on people to get to what they need and what they so, want. So within that space, all right, we could, I know that I've had several conversations with a human being that we all know and are currently Picasso. dealing with. Picasso. Um, that, you know, <laughs> going to drink to that <laughs> <laughs> we, where, all, we all needed a sip of wine for that Sorry, where <laughs> let's let's let me let for I hate to say this but let's talk about this for a second and I, I don't want to say this but to a degree as as much pain as the narcissist causes us when we talk about how successful they are the world would not be the world that we live in and although in many ways I don't like the world that we live in but there are lots of narcissists that hold high positions in certain places. For example, surgeons. There are some surgeons that, I mean, listen, and if you're an ER, if you're an ER doctor or something and, and you have very little attachment and you just get the job done. And I mean, like, there's a reason I'm not a nurse. There's a reason I'm not a doctor. There's a reason I'm not a coroner because my empathy is too high to handle that level of trauma and that level of horrific experience. So to a degree, narcissisms are re narcissists are required in society. Is that true? Or is that, am I completely false in that? They have conquered worlds, right? Like they have, they have, they serve a um, purpose, right? I mean, to a yes, degree, they, they have served a purpose and, 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 don't really understand why um, and don't believe that there is a problem with being the way they are. And, and then they try to have human relationships with people. <laughs> and, That's where we then, fall short. Like, short yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And here's the thing with NPD, and I'm not going to read the criteria, but I did a video that said NPD they're all abusive. And I got reamed by those who don't know NPD. And I said, it's in the DSM. So here's the thing about NPD is they gaslight, they mind fuck, they lie, they demean, they devalue. All of those things are emotionally and mentally abusive. And here's one thing that if you read, this is another thing that lay people don't understand. You need to read everything that goes beyond the criteria. You need to read the diagnostic features. You need to read the associated features. The diagnostic features, this I do want to read. Individuals with narcissistic personality believe that they are superior, special, or unique and expect others to recognize them as such. And if you don't, they can become furious. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so funny to me. <laughs> Gosh, it sounds familiar. Yes. Yeah, I mean, but here's why it's so funny. If you do not recognize me as your superior, as a woman, as not only as a woman, but as a minority woman, when I hear that, I just, I hate to be so generalizing, but I think of almost every man I've ever met. Yeah. And Multiply I feel like that. I feel like the old narcissists, true NPDs are so valuable when it comes to furthering, not society, but as far as like, in the workforce, in technology, because they're so self-involved and they're so into furthering technology and all of these things. But when it comes to human relationships, all they do is fuck shit up. Oh, always. All they do is hurt people. All they do is take advantage of them. All they do is abuse. So when it comes to furthering society, furthering technology, getting, getting shit done and getting shit handled, conquering things and all the, all that below all that stuff. Right. They're very proficient at that. But when it comes to matters of the heart, all they do is mm -hmm. break it. 
all they do is fuck it up. Right. Their their motto is it's it's all business, right? It's all business. And even in human relationships, it's just business. That's ruthless. Business and money. It's not yeah, it's about them. It's about getting their needs met. It's about the mission they're on. It's not about it, it, and whoever they have to step on to accomplish, accomplish that mission. It's just the business. Don't cry about it, bitch. And they just, that's, that's how they treat everyone in their lives. Narcissistic so. personality disorder. They are very self-loathing, very self-loathing. Somewhere in their childhood. Now, remember everything that we discuss, it's biopsychosocial. So it's not because of nurturing alone. It's not because of nature alone. It's a biopsychosocial thing. Someone asked me today, well, what causes it that we can change? We don't know. It's something in the womb, something genetic, then they're predisposed, and then something happens. Real or imagined, real or perceived, and if it, they perceive it, then it's real to them. So something happened where they felt they didn't get the love that they should have gotten. They, they didn't, they, they were less than, so they yeah. spend the rest of their lives searching to replace that hole that was made in their life. I'm going to make up an age at six years old. Now they're 50 years old. Who the fuck knows what that feels like? They don't know. So they're constantly trying to fill a hole that they could never fill because they don't know what it is. And they're not six years old anymore, so they'll never be able to fill it. They have no self-worth at all. They take it from other people. They feel very inferior. So the inside of a narcissist is very different than what they portray. It's a mask that they portray. And they're also masking that from themselves. So yeah. they you know, and I hear this and I want to just, I do enough videos on yelling at people for this. They do not attach to people who are weak. They do not attach to people who are lonely. They do not attach to people who are codependent. They do not attach to people searching for love. They attach to someone who will benefit them. They attach themselves to people who are better and far superior than them. Because if you cannot, if you're down here and you cannot bring people down, you're gonna attach yourself to bring yourself up. If I am surrounded by someone who is better than me in stature and professional stature, personal stature, um, financial stature, looks, um, academics, any of that, then I see I am superior as well. Yeah. So basically what they're doing, let's, let's, I have a couple of things. So basically what they're doing is they attach themselves to people who have the things are the things that they feel like they're lacking in order to use those people as stepping stones to get to where they want to go. Yes and no. They use it to fill their, their feelings of inferiority. If I can surround myself by someone who's beautiful, by people who are beautiful, then I'm beautiful. If I can surround myself with, look at like my ex, look at, I'm with a doctor. I'm with a doctor and all her doctor friends. So I must be of the same level because why right. else would they want to be with me? Until Sorry, I was going to add until they realize that we are not just doctors and therapists and, and like strong, amazing people 100% of the time until they realize that we're actually kind of flawed human beings ourselves. And then that whole idealization, like they, they attach to the us because they want to fill that need. Thanks. And then they're like, Oh, they're really not perfect human beings, which means I'm not going to be viewed as a perfect fucking human being. So now I'm going to make them feel like shit because I feel like shit. So they attach themselves to titles. The people who will benefit not, them. In yeah. So, so they're, they're attached to the title and the idealization, not to the person. No. Right. Is that correct? Because let's say 
you have a shit ton of money. You have a yacht. You're all your friends are these amazingly rich people. Well, now you're in that circle too. So even though you know that you don't belong there, because they know, they still know that they are inferior because they're lying to themselves. So if you know, but look at, I am surrounded, you know, Instagram, look at, I am in San Tropez with all of these people. See how good I am? <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't fill that hole that was made at six years old. So eventually it's like, well, fuck this shit. You're worthless. I mean, so they, all I hear, I think, I think everyone right now, while they're hearing this discussion, all they're hearing right now is the description of the person that they're currently thinking of that they've labeled the narcissist in their life. Like for real, for like when I am listening to you talk, all I see is one image in my in my brain right now. Someone, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, my ex used to say, and this is funny because he is number one in seniority at the institution. And he, that is him. When he puts on his uniform, he literally changes his stature, his demeanor, everything. Because now he is number one. Now, when we were together, one of his nemesis at the prison was dating a social worker. So how do you think he felt? Oh, he's only dating a social worker. Literally, he said this. He's dating a social worker. I'm dating a doctor. But it's like, Wow. I mean, I, I, I thought it was funny, but it's like, yeah, they're the prom princess and prince and we're the prom king and queen. But that's exactly it. It's like, ha, 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 look at that guy. He's only got a social worker. I got myself a doctor. That, that's, that, it doesn't matter that it was me. It mattered that it was a doctor. That's how sad it is. And we sadly... And I want to strangle victim blamers. It is easy. Anybody can be duped by NPD because they're good. They've had a lifetime of perfecting their mask. And mm-hmm. they will listen to you when they meet you, when they court you, for lack of a better word, they're listening. Probably the only time in the relationship they're truly listening. And they're listening to you to say, for example, um, my husband passed away. And I remember I said to my ex, my husband was my emotional rock. Even if, you know, like if the guardrail on a, on a mountain road, it's not really going to help you fall, not from falling off the mountain, but you feel safer with it there. My, that was my husband. He was my guardrail. And I remember my ex saying, I want to be that for you. Now it wasn't odd because we had gone out, you know, a few times. So it wasn't, we were starting to get serious. So it wasn't odd to hear that. I want to be that rock for you. I didn't know at the time that that's his pull of I'm, I'm see, I'm such a good person. And in between saying, I'm going to be that rock for you, he's ta- also would say, oh my God, I'm such a, my, I'm a piece of shit. And I'd be like, how are you a piece of shit? You're so good. Look at what you've done. Look at the kind things that you have done for me, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they reel you in by being Good enough, not too good, not too good to be true, but good enough that you're like, wow, wow, this is, this is what I'm looking for. And then they slowly, like they might be a half hour late to your first date and you're like, fuck, but they have an excuse. And so you're like, okay, okay. You know, this, this, some people have time management problems. But actually talking about the initiation of the trauma bond, y'all pay attention. (laughs) But what they're doing is this is a form of control. This is Mm -hmm. a form of seeing what you're going to tolerate. Yes. Yes. 
Here comes the Taliban. <laughs> so, so let's 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 just stop right there. So for a set for a moment, let's let's interject about so the narcissist their their priorities are one. I would say, this is what I would say based on my experience with the narcissist, is their number one priority is to be in control. Yep. To be in control of the, the circumstances. And of you. The people, the outcome, and the narrative. Mm-hmm. So... Uh-huh. The narrative. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. I mean, literally, be, because they have to ensure this is based off my experience with narcissists. They're, the most important thing is that you are abiding to the story that they've created up here in their brain and that you are play, stay in your plane, play your role abide by the rules. I don't need your opinion. Do what I say or get the fuck out of here. That, that is the thing. And then, so for most of us, we just want to be chosen so badly that we're like, okay, 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 okay. But that's the thing is their control of the situation, the person, the narrative and the outcome. Because Mm -hmm. is it that, is it because they feel so out of control that their six-year-old, two-year-old, five-year-old self is so out of control that now in their adulthood, that the only thing they they care about is micromanagement, the control of every single piece and every single item. And if you step out of line, I'm going to discard you and find someone who will stay in their position and will stay in their, in their role. That's how they get their needs met. That's it's, it's just how they get that need met. And then it's that belief, that delusional kind of belief that they actually are superior to everybody else, that they are smarter than everybody else. And whether or not that's reality doesn't matter to them. They actually like, there's that wounded child in there somewhere. Right. But as adults, these people are really, really exploitive and abusive in the way that they have built an entire human being around getting their needs met in the most maladaptive fucking way possible, which is by hurting other people. And that's not about taking care of their little inner child anymore because they absolutely don't even give a fuck about that anymore because now they really have built a personality that believes they're superior to everybody else if that makes sense like there yeah. these aren't people that have the ability to have the insight that there is a wound to even have worked on that that, yes. that need is getting met they they've built a whole life around nobody's going to fucking meet my needs so i'm going to make everybody meet my needs well and that's thing what, that i one okay. thing ashley that i do want to correct that i want to correct is because you said we want to be loved so bad i it, again to me that sounds like it's it makes it our fault and i know that's not what you mean but that sounds to me like we want to be loved so bad so we believe it and i think what you're saying what they do is they make such a bond with us we bond with them that when they, they, cause they don't blast their NPD in the beginning and we no. grow attached to them so that when the NPD starts to come out, we've fallen in love with these people. And it's not that we want to be loved so bad. It's that we thought that this was a, an actual true real, we got a glimpse of this great relationship, this great potential. Where is it? If only, if they would stop lying, if they would stop doing this, we can have that potential that I saw in the beginning. So it's yes. not that we want to be loved so bad, it's that we want that potential that we saw, that they gave to us. Where did it go? Well, so Where I'm going to, I'll be, I'll be, yes, I agree with you, but I'm going to be super fucking honest. Love. Who doesn't? I'm going to be super fucking honest. I came to a very hard realization with myself that 
I was absolutely 100% desperate to be loved. I was desperate to be chosen because I, of my own trauma, I, I was willing with my ex, I felt because of my trauma and what I had gone through, through my childhood and then being raped as in, as a, as a young teen, like as a teen in college, I was willing to stick it out with him because I felt like all that I want is love. And I can, I can change. I can become what he wants. I can become, I can do everything. I would just tell me what to do. Tell me what to tell me how to, how high to jump. Tell me how low to crawl. But that was after he already got you. That exactly. was after. See, that's what I'm exactly. saying. Is don't blame yourself that you got into this desperately wanting love. He had already shown you. And that's what you wanted back. He showed you love in the beginning, didn't he? Oh my God. He worshiped the ground I walked on. And that's what you wanted back. So that's what you were willing to hell and high, will go through hell and high water to get back. Because I know also when I, when my ex and I, before we split up and he was going to go with his new supply and he's like, well, you know, this wasn't working in our relationship. And I'm like, I'll work on it. I'll work on it. I'm so embarrassed right now to say this. And I'm embarrassed for myself, but I was like, I'll work on it. What is it that's not happening anymore? Let's get it back. What do I have to do? So it's not that you're desperate for love. I think you were desperate for what they gave you and you wanted it back. Because I think when you say you're desperate for love, that sounds like he picked you up and manipulated you. Well, he manipulated you off the bat, but that you were just this weak. Don't blame yourself is basically what I'm trying to say. Right. And he manipulated you. It's not our fault that we got played, but it's, you know, it's certainly relatable to know that when you're vulnerable enough, these, these are the people that tend to fucking come into your life when you're vulnerable and it's like, they can smell it and they they like ray off of your vulnerabilities because they listen to you and you give them your vulnerabilities, not intentionally, you don't Mm -hmm. pour out your vulnerability. You yeah, work out your vulnerable <laughs> abilities. You, uh, you know, through the course of a relationship, you open up. You open up your heart. You open up your inner secrets. You open up, and then they turn around and weaponize it against you. And you're left with a "What the fuck? What did I do? Let's get this back." By then, you're Let's already bonded something. to them. By then, you're yeah. already bonded. That's them. a trauma bond. So I want to, Ashley, please don't say you were so desperate. Yes, you were desperate to go. Oh, I was, desperate. I was hella desperate. And, but you like, were desperate I was, and I'm not blaming back, myself. You were desperate to get back that love that he gave you in the beginning. If he there didn't give that. you that love. There was that, that, but I'm not blaming myself. Okay. I'm not. It's, it's a self-awareness that my be, my trauma comes from being not only not only my nine-year-old self when I was molested but also my mother wounds that I experienced as a child where I felt completely emotionally abandoned and I didn't feel like I had the love and the acceptance that I needed and I remember thinking I remember being in sixth grade eighth grade, ninth grade in the shower, getting ready for school in the morning and thinking to myself, no one's going to love me. All that I want is love. All that I want is to be loved. All that I want is to be accepted, but no one's going to love me. I'm not good enough. Like I remember the only thing I wanted in my life was to be loved for me. Like, and so like just reaching, 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 please love me. Please choose me. Please accept me. And when, so when I say like, I was desperate for love, I truly was, but not to the point where I blame myself, but to the point of me acknowledging that my desperation to be loved and chosen was one of the reasons that I was willing to, to overlook mistreatment and to, to betray my own boundaries, not to the point where I will say like, it's your fault, Ashley. 
honestly, not at all, because my trauma wasn't my fault. But to the point where I would say that, like, my desperation to be loved by by someone else overpowered my ability to love myself to the point where I was like, no, that's not okay. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. But remember, Ashley, because I know when my husband passed away, before he passed away, shit happened. And I'll talk about it another time, but it was very traumatizing. So when my ex came along and after like six months, I told him about all the trauma that I went through and he eventually weaponized that against me. But um, so it was hard for me to trust and to love and all of that. And he swore this was, you know, never going to happen on and on and on. So yeah, I get the, I was desperate to be loved. I was desperate for, if you will, the love that he had showed me in the beginning that was kind of validating, um, that helped me with the trauma that I went through with my husband and the potential of, okay, I can have this again. I think that if he didn't show you the love initially, you wouldn't have stayed with this person. But because he showed you love initially, he wrapped you up, he mind fucked you, he gaslit you. And so then to take that love away, then you're desperate to get it back as well because you had a taste of it and it was good. And that's how a trauma bond is also formed. I agree. I think I relate, Ashley, to what you're trying to say, which is that at, there was a point where we saw that this was not healthy, that this was toxic, and we... It was too late. And we were like, we'll be the ones to change or we'll try to accept them for who they are so that we don't have to lose everything that we've you know, worked for. And so I, I relate a lot to that. And I think other people listening probably do too, because at some point, you know, we're not dumb. Like at some point we're like, this is not, this is totally not what relationships are supposed to look like. Right. And yet we're the ones willing to t- completely self-sacrifice by that point. And this is all because we're bonded to this person at this point. Because but, they showed us so much right, potential that's the, in the relationship. That's the bond what part, is it? But, and Future then, faking? And then no. there's like, but then there's like, once you know that, and then it happens again, mm-hmm. people are like, what the fuck? fuck is wrong with me <laughs> oh my I god i already went through this one fucking time i went through this before why am i and i feel like this is happening again and i'm still letting it happen and my boundaries are once again being completely eroded bit by bit and i fucking yes. actually kind of see it happening this time yeah. and yet what the fuck so i think that's what it I relate to in Ashley's experience and what other people might relate to who kind of have had this pattern of relationships like this, where they're like, why does, why am I, am I, I know I'm not a stupid person. I know I've like learned something from my past relationships, yes. right? Like, but we, what we is also, it about me that keeps doing this? Because yes. we also hope, again, remember, they didn't blast their MPD. They showed us enough to make us fall in love. So we keep looking for that because it's like, well, it was there. It was there. Where did it go? Why isn't it there? Just, just listen to me. Let me explain. Cause again, it's gotta be, sadly, we think this has gotta be something, even though we in maybe logically know this, we don't, it's gotta be something that I did. I know there were so many times when I left my ex, I had a recording on my phone that I don't, I remember recording it, but I didn't remember that I recorded it. And like a year later, I'm like, oh, I remember when I did this, we were having a heated discussion because 
And then the whole thing, I'm listening to it, you know, a year later going, what the fuck was I thinking? I'm spending the whole conversation saying, why aren't you listening to me? If you listen to what I'm saying, you'll hear what I'm saying. And he was over here deflecting, gaslighting, mind fucking, changing the subject. And I'm like, why won't you listen? And the whole fucking half an hour is me saying, I'm not saying this. I'm saying this. Listen. What? And I'm listening to this video audio saying, why the fuck didn't I leave? Why didn't I walk away when he said, well, I'm not discussing this and you can leave. And I'm like, why won't you discuss it? If we just sat and talked, I'm sure you, we could come to some sort of agreement. And he's like, and then he would say something I did. And again, gaslight deflect and all of that. And I'm listening to the audio going, why the fuck did this go on for 30 minutes? Why did I allow it to go on for a minute? Why did I not walk away? They fucking tell on themselves too. They tell on themselves. Oh my God. And you hear it and you're like, and they'll, they will literally fucking tell you. I was just yes. thinking of this. Like they, they will, will literally tell fucking tell you, get the fuck away from me. Yes. Danger. They will tell you. And, and it's so, this is so, uh, this person that I think we're all thinking of, but this fucking person Picasso. <laughs> would, go, Picasso. Would, go, would go and tell people Picasso. the first time you catch him in a lie he would say the first time you catch him in hey, a lie get Heather, the fuck away Heather, we're gonna do a drinking game and anytime it's Picasso we gotta take a drink Picasso Picasso fuck so he will tell people he will say the first like people need to fucking earn your trust. And the first time they fuck that up, you walk away. The first time you catch them in that lie, that's it. Boundaries, walk the fuck away. And it's like, they tell you what to do with them. They're like- They do, we, they do. They do tell you what to do with them and you don't like, do it. I'm going to fucking lie to you a whole shit ton. And the second you catch me, you better fucking run or I won't stop. The and they never lie is, about that. The problem is the way they tell you is what is it called a compliment sandwich? The way they tell you is a joke. Like, like my joking. ex would say, "Oh my god, my ex is psycho. Look at the text she sent me." And I would look at the text and go, "Holy fuck, what's wrong with this woman?" But he wouldn't show me the text before. He would tell me the situation, but he wouldn't show me what occurred. So again, yeah. they'll, sh they'll give you bits and pieces that in hindsight, you're like, fucking idiot. But yeah. in the moment, they're telling you, but they're telling you in a way of like, like my ex would say, I would, I would say, oh my God, all these guys at work and he's like, oh, I'm a piece of shit. And I'm like, oh my God, no, you're way better than every, I've never heard anything negative about you. They waited till we split up because before they told me all the shit. But I hear negative things about everybody else, you know, so they do it in a way that you're like, context is everything. Remember that because I've had so many people say, why was I so stupid? I didn't take heed of it. It's because you're, it's in context, in context. Mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're giving you a massage and they're sending you to the spa to get your nail done and your hair done. And then they're telling you, oh, by the way, I'm a fucking idiot. You're like, no, you're not. Look at what you're doing for me. That's when they'll do it. They'll do it when they're doing something nice. Well, they they're hit you and say I'm abuser. No, do something. They'll give yeah. you flowers and say, oh, by the way, I lied. And you're well, like, oh, flowers. I don't want to admit this, but like, so we've all heard. Well, maybe not everyone. I mean, I know that all three of us have had but you know maybe there's a, probably a lot of it, listeners that may have not heard that on average it's you go back we go back seven to nine times before we finally leave and, and for me includes death by the way yes and for I mean I probably left I don't know how I how I accomplished this it's probably like 15 times I mean this is over the course of 13 and a half years um well, 15 now, but um, I literally, after about the 
fifth time I left, there was a different thought process in my mind where it was very self-important on my end where I was like, my love can change him. (laughs) My, I can change him. Like what Mm -hmm. I know about love and what Mm -hmm. I've learned I mean, mm-hmm. I remember thinking this, like, yep. I can change him. It's fine. It's okay. I can change him. Like, I just need to take the criticisms he's told me. I need to maladapt myself mm-hmm. and also, like, implement this grandiose love that I have, which is life changing. And then he'll come to terms. And I can fix all of this. You are screaming the codependence anthem right now. (laughs) Oh my God. What creates codependency in people is abuse of people like this. Because codependency is not something, some some people are not codependent in all their fucking relationships. It's situational. These fucking people can create a codependency in us because they're such fucking soul suckers. That and codependency happens. is e- enabling the behavior of the other person. So when it people think codependency, firm. they think of, oh my God, I'm like, well, I've done to this person. I don't let go. Codependency means you enable the behavior to continue. The behavior at the of the expense other person of your entire self. Uh, your Ew, whole self God. gets put aside. You're like, I am so special. Like I have, I did the same thing, Ashley, with my ex. I was like, there was a part of me that was like, well, I'm a mental health therapist now and I work in the criminal justice system so I can handle him. And I, I can be the one that changes him after all of the other people he's been in contact with that haven't been able to change him. I can be the one to change him because we have something special because we have history together and I, you know, and I can, I can adapt and learn to cope with everything because that's what I do at work, right? So I can do it in my romantic relationships too. It was like a whole other level of I will. And at at one point I was like, I will let him be himself, which is an abusive drug addict piece of shit. <laughs> as long as I don't have to lose him, oh my I will God. let him do. I will let him be, and I will cope and adjust, and that will be what ultimately changes him. Is my acceptance of him yes. as he is, and your whole self gets put in the shitter, and you're like, oh, bye self, and no boundaries anymore. Bye self. Bye and self. It, yeah, it's so exactly what I went through with my ex it is the codependence anthem to do stuff like that um especially with addiction with people who are addicts like because you want to regain some control right they're so uh, they can be so unpredictable they can be so out of control that you in an attempt to regain control of your life you kind of do become a controlling person right like oh, wait one oh my god I was oh I'm yeah out and you do it in the name the difference is you're not controlling in the name of like getting your abuse needs met and abusing other people. You're, you're controlling it. And because you care about this person, you're trying to fix them. Like I will fix you. And it's all, it's all pretty delusional when I look back at it (laughs) because it's like, are you serious? That's how you, you already know that's how that codependent shit works. And yet you, walked right into it and part of what got me out like the fourth time because it took me to me five times four or five times leaving um or being discarded one of the two and like the I remember one of the times that um we broke up was because I finally read the book codependent no more because I finally was like I feel what this is (laughs) like I know I'm being a codependent piece of shit right now so I read that book and I was like and he was watching me read this book and he was like, oh shit, like she's coming, you know, she's coming to her senses um, and would start these huge fights and then 
uh, eventually it would end in some discard, either me kicking him out or him leaving me for some other woman, whatever that he was already cheating on me with. Anyway, so yeah. I was so proud of myself. Now I'm, I'm just so humiliated, but I was so proud of myself because I got him to communicate because he would never communicate appropriately. And I taught him appropriate communication. You like thought her knew what he was doing. He could communicate. He's, he played the, he played the, ah, shocks. I'm just dummy, like really good really well yes uh, yes and okay picasso so one more picasso statement because i know we have to end soon but like the warning like when the, the big red flag that i chose to ignore there was when i texted what i asked what his sign was well i said my friend wants to know what your sign is and his response was literally the street sign that says danger ahead they fucking tell on them. No, I'm sorry. I'm he, sorry. <coughs> that that right there, uh, that uh, right there. When we talk about context and people saying, "Why did I? Why was I so stupid? Why did I know?" If you have no idea, and somebody says that, and a non NPD person can say that, and you're like, ha, 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 "That's so funny," but with an NPD person there, fucking serious so yep. that's where context is everything and that's how they dupe us so well because they again don't say ha huh, this is and they pull something like really bizarre out of their ass that you're like whoa they put you know danger ahead and you're like oh. <laughs> i did too i was like oh that's a good one like <laughs> and then you look back and go ha ha <laughs> yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's narcissistic personality disorder. We <laughs> have <laughs> we have so much more to say. We are coming to the end, so we have to wrap it up because we want to keep you guys attention. Your your, I'm gonna do this every time. We're we want to. I had nothing to eat, so you have to understand. This is why complain when you can wine. So if you don't understand that we've been drinking wine, then this is not the podcast for you. So yes, we're professionals. Yes, we can drink wine. This is not therapy. <laughs> Anyways, so we are coming to the end. We've got to wrap it up because we want to keep your attention. We want to have you come back, but we will 100% guaranteed I don't like to speak in absolute, abs <laughs> absolute, but I can tell you, we will be talking about this for a long time. <laughs> and we're going to tell you some dirty little secrets also. So at that, on that, I'm going to ask if you guys have any dirty little secrets that you want to share, put them in the comments of our podcast and we'll share them i don't know if you want to you are more than welcome to put your name put anonymous put whatever but we're going to share some really really good dirty little secrets <laughs> Just yay so we'll continue this npd on our next episode um yeah and if you have questions if you have comments feel free and we'll respond as best as we can because remember, we are attempting to make sense of toxic nonsense. Wow. Drink wine. Drink wine. <laughs> See you next week. Have a happy Halloween. Woohoo! Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs>